Greeting Earthlings! If you follow the channel, you know that we love all things Apollo, and that during our last visit to Steve Jervetson's amazing space collection, we were given the opportunity to take two holy boxes of Apollo electronics to our lab. These are the boxes that brought you voice, data and live TV from the moon, and should be early masterpieces of microwave electronics, the blackest of black arts in analog electronics. In episode 1, we showed how the complex S-band system worked by transmitting over three frequencies. In episode 2, we took a close look inside a power amplifier and learned about traveling wave tubes. In this episode, we'll turn our attention to the transponder itself, which is quite amazing for a mid-1960s design. Removing the cover reveals a myriad of analog electronic modules. It looks large and complicated, until you realize that you are looking at not one, but five microwave radios. This box actually contains two S-band receivers and three S-band transmitters. Considering it was made in the mid-1960s and is all solid state, it truly was a miracle of miniaturization at the time. You'll gain a better appreciation when we show you the ground equivalent of this in a future episode. The equivalent ground hardware, implemented in a more standard way, yet still completely solid state, covers my whole table from end to end. So what does it all do? Well, it looks complicated because it does a lot. Let's go back to our S-band block diagram that we saw in the last episode. The transponder is the box in blue. On one side, it is attached to the pre-modulator box. We'll leave the details of that one for later. On the other side, it goes to the power amplifier box, which we reviewed in detail in the previous episode, and then to the mini S-band antennas. When the PM link from Earth is received by one of the antennas, it goes first through the triplexer, which extracts it and sends it towards the transponder. The signal then comes to a switch, which is controlled by this green button that says primary secondary. In the schematic, the switch is shown in the secondary position. That will turn on receiver number 2 and direct the received signal to it. If there is enough signal at the right frequency, the receiver will lock onto it and out comes voice and data. Of course, receiver number 2 is actually the backup receiver. So let's toggle the switch to primary, its normal position, and the receiver number 1 is used instead. The two PM receivers are absolutely identical, and when we take a closer look at the box, you'll see that everything is duplicated. As soon as the receiver gets enough signal from Earth, it locks onto it using a phase locked loop circuit, or PLL for short. This key circuit will track the received frequency exactly down to a few hertz. The recovered PLL frequency equal to that sent from Earth but slightly shifted by the Doppler effect, is then passed on to the PM transmitter. Then more RF magic happens. The recovered frequency is multiplied by 240 and divided by 221 exactly. This is called frequency translation. So outcomes are translated PM signal out of the PM transmitter, through the amplifier and off to Houston it goes. Quickly note that there is another duplicate PM transmitter for redundancy. Now let's flip one more switch, this one called ranging at the bottom right. This will close our famous turnaround loop. The receiver will now send the pseudo-random data it received from Earth right back through the transmitter. Basically, when ranging, we are repeating what we heard, echoing it back on the downlink frequency. Distance to the spaceship can then be derived by measuring the delay through the transmission loop. Ok, we are already doing a lot, but we can do even more if we flip one of these extra two buttons in the middle. You can see on the labels, we can send data that was recorded from tape, signal from our scientific instruments, or our favorite, television from our spaceship. This will activate our last transmitter, the FM transmitter. And here goes another completely independent downlink to Earth on wideband FM. 
This one is unidirectional though and has no backup. So now we're cooking. We have live voice and data both ways plus ranging information on the PM link while we use the FM link for simultaneously sending the extras like previously recorded data or live television. There's one more function worth mentioning in this very complicated affair. That's the antenna tracking. This is an extra function of our PM receiver used to point our high gain antenna in the correct direction. We'd go even further into the weeds to explain this other complicated system, but just know it's there. So hello, this is Mark from the future. We have already hooked the transponder, but uh, let's highlight the organization of the transponder compared to the block diagram we've just seen. So the RF signal comes in from the antenna via the tri triplexer in that plug over here. And then it goes around, follows that connector. So that's the input to the receivers. And here the first thing that you have is a pin diode switch. So since this is microwave uh, and this is low level signal, you can use a, a pin diode switch instead of the big relay in the amplifier. So that obviously will give the receive signal either to one of the receivers or to the other. So you can see that most of our modules are duplicated and that's of course our dual PM receiver. Uh, so here are the two input stages. Then we have a whole bunch of modules and it's sort of written on it what it is. The two PM receiver start, start stop right here. So this is PM1 and this is PM2 or, or vice versa. I, I can't remember which side is which. And uh, out at some point here, you see the narrow band detectors and the wide band detectors. This is the output and the output gets combined back here together and gets over here. So here it's not very high frequency anymore. So you can just use a simple combiner. You, you put them together and out goes the output in one of those connectors. Now the transmitters, they are relatively small. So here's the first transmitter for PM and here's the redundant second transmitter for PM. So it's just an exciter, uh, which is os aux oscillator and PM mod. So the aux oscillator is the oscillator it uses before being locked. So that's the free running one. And then you see the power amplifier out here. And then down here, uh, hidden somewhere, are the multipliers. The input of the PM also is split in two. So it goes to each of the PM transceiver. And same thing, this is the input is relatively low frequency. So there is no need for, for a pin switch or an RF relay. And eventually that comes out over here. That's the uh, PM RF stuff. The FM, there is only one. Uh, it's this fellow over here. You have the exciter, the power amplifier uh, right here, and uh, probably another multiplier somewhere here. And it comes out uh, on the FM and plug black to the traveling tube amplifier and eventually the antenna. On this end, we have figured out uh, all of it. You have the PM modulation in for the PM transceivers, which is you know, just being split right here. And then uh, the FM the, the, the FM signal, you have two inputs. You have either the data or the TV. Uh, and then you have the output of the receiver, which actually comes out of the wideband and detector. Uh, right here. Now also on this end you have the power supplies and it's actually three independent power supplies in this rather big block. It's everything that's in this metal block uh, with the uh, 400 hertz three phase coming here. There's one power supply for the FM transmitter and one power supply each for the PM transponders. So it's actually three power supplies in one, uh, completely independent. And finally, let's look at the markings over here. We have uh, the Motorola brand over here with the serial number. 
and the modules are marked frequency multiplier second mixer first intermediate frequency amplifier wideband detector narrowband detector second intermediate frequency amplifier voltage control oscillator the VCO and then we switch to the transmitter we have the aux oscillator and the PM modulator you have the power amplifier for the PM then we get into the FM so that's not symmetric anymore you have the power amplifier FM the FM exciter so that drives this uh, and then we, those two modules, they are actually part of the receiver. They are the uh, RF tracking amplifiers. Those are for seeing the high gain antenna, those uh, pointed in the right direction. So, so far, uh, all makes sense. It's very compact. And you might ask yourself, what's up with all that wiring here? Can we make any sense out of it? And it turns out uh, we can and we should. Here's a more detailed block diagram of one of the PM receivers. Our uplink signal comes in through the pin switch and it is at 2.106 GHz plus or minus the Doppler shift. We'll call that received frequency Fn. It then goes into a mixer. The mixer is one of these magical RF circuits that will shift the frequency of the input by the frequency of the local oscillator. In our case, the local oscillator comes from a 19 MHz crystal control VCO. Now, VCO stands for Voltage Control Oscillator. It's an oscillator which frequency you can slightly shift around using a voltage, a property which will come in very handy in a minute. So our VCO output goes through a series of multipliers which multiplies its frequency by one weight all the way up to the microwave S-band at about 2.058 uh, GHz. Our signal comes out of the mixer, its frequency being the difference between the two inputs, so it is now at 47.6 MHz. Note that the PM modulation information is unchanged by the mixing, it's just the carrier that is now at a drastically lower frequency. We are out of the microwave regime and we can comfortably use 1960s era transistors to amplify and filter the signal. We then hit another mixer and this time its local oscillator is VCO times 2. So out comes our signal shifted by an additional 38 MHz which brings it down to 9.5 MHz. Now we go to yet another circuit, this time a phase detector, which is actually more of a phase comparator. The second input to our phase detector is our VCO frequency, now divided by 2. This is done so both inputs are approximately at the same frequency, both around 9.5 MHz. And then we let the phase locked loop, or PLL for short, do its magic. If there is any phase difference between the two inputs, the detector will output a corrective voltage to the VCO until both match exactly. When the phase error is zero, we have achieved phase lock and the two input frequencies to the phase detector are exactly the same. If you rearrange the terms of this equation, you'll find that the lock condition implies that the VCO frequency equals the received frequency over 110.5. We are now ready to send our locked VCO times 4 as a reference to the transmitter. And in the meantime, we have of course demodulated the incoming PM information. The voice and data subcarriers are sent to the pre modulator processor for further extraction. Finally, the ranging signal is also sent to the transmitter for the turnaround. Fortunately, the transmitter is conceptually much simpler. As we have just seen, it gets the reference frequency from the receiver in the form of VCO times 4. Note the presence of a switch. When we are out of lock, the transmitter is referenced to an unlocked auxiliary oscillator. Voice can be transmitted, but no ranging information can be obtained. But let's assume we are in the normal mode, we are locked. 
we switch over to the locked reference VCO times 4 and also get the turned around range encode input. This reference frequency is then PM modulated with both the range encode and the voice and data subcarriers. Then it makes it through a power amplifier, then a 30 times multiplier chain which puts us right back into the S-band. And at what frequency, you may ask? Well, at VCO times 4 times 30, which is 120 times our original VCO. But we now know that the VCO is locked to Fn over 110.5. So the transmitter frequency is Fn times 120 over 110.5 which is equal to our famous 240 over 221 turnaround ratio. Whew, I am not sure how they ever came up with this scheme, but this ratio is still used today by many S-band spacecrafts, including the International Space Station. Okay, now that you know everything about the transponder, let's see if we can make sense of this rat's nest of coaxes here. So fortunately, they follow the good HP tradition of uh, naming all the RF modules so we know what, sh what each of these are. I put it over there. Uh, and it's easy to start with the input. So the blue line, that's uh, the RF input uh, that goes to the antenna, comes from the triplexer. And we saw that it came back through the pin uh, switch and comes into the first mixer and it's conveniently labeled input. Uh, so that makes sense so far. So we should get a local oscillator from somewhere. Uh, so if you put, see it's written LO, local oscillator input. Uh, so that has to be VCO times 108. We know that from the uh, block diagram and conveniently it goes to the frequency multiplier. So this makes perfect sense. That's exactly where it should come from. So you have to feed the multiplier um, most probably by the VCO. Is there a connection to the VCO? Yes, there is. Here's our beautiful VCO connection. So everything goes according to plan so far. So we have our VCO multiplied by 108. So what else can we see that makes sense? Well, we can follow the output of the first mixer. So that's the uh, first intermediate frequency and sure enough it goes into the first IF amplifier. Things are proceeding according to plan. So it must comes out, it must come out to the second mixer. It does right there. So second mixer needs a VCO input. That's the local oscillator and we know it's VCO times two. So goes back to the multiplier, uh, still makes sense. Uh, and out of the second mixer comes the intermediate frequency number two. Does it go to the amplifier number two? Yes, it does. So this must be the output of the mixer and the input of the amplifier. Now, uh, there are actually two outputs of uh, this uh, intermediate frequency number two, there is another one that we know goes to the wide band detector. And I believe this is this wire. And out of our wide band detector comes our uh, uh, received output. So it goes over to the top where we saw it was, uh, it, it gets into a T uh, with the result from the uh, other uh, receiver and then the output of the T goes to the input. Everything checks out so far. Uh, we also know that out of the wideband detector, uh, the ranging information should come out to the transmitter and the transmitter uh, starts here. Do we see a wire between the two? Yes, we do. So that yellow wire should be ranging. Still makes sense. What else? Uh, so there are more uh, outputs of the, uh, this, this is the outputs of the uh, intermediate frequency number two, I believe. 
they need to go to the narrow band detector. And from other diagrams, I know that there are uh, several outputs that go to that detector. So I was not surprised to find two of them. And now um, uh, the phase detector is in the narrow band module. So we should see a VCO output. We should see a connection between the narrow band and the VCO and we see one. So I surmise this is VCO control. Uh, and, and those two uh, form the PLL loop, those two modules. What else? Uh, which is that one? That's, uh, ah, uh, yes, the wideband detector is a uh, coherent detector, so it needs a VCO reference to it. So that's uh, the green wire here that goes from the VCO. And uh, so does the narrow band detector. It also needs a VCO reference. Um, and I believe it needs VCO over two. So I suspect that the um, divider by two is in the, they've stuck it in the wide band detector module because this is the only connection to something uh, that could make sense. I would have VCO in it that I could find. Uh, so yes, one more here that makes sense. We know out of the uh, narrow band, uh, no, actually out of the IF amplifier comes an AM detector that uh, does the pointing of the antenna. So it should go to the track module and we see that wire. So we have identified that one too, which is that one uh, VCO times four. Oh yeah. So now uh, we have done our receiver pretty much. Uh, so we know that the um, transmitter is driven by the locked VCO times four, and that's the only output we didn't have uh, connected out of our frequency multiplier. And sure enough, guess where it goes? It goes to our uh, transmitter. So we see that. Actually, we have the ranging input, we have the VCO input, all we need is the PM input and that also comes from the T over there because it's split between the two uh, transmitters. So that checks out, that must be the input. And then it goes on the output, that's the power amplifier, the second purple wire goes in the bowels of the thing uh, and where it hits the multiplier. So the multiplier for the PM must be on the other side, we don't see it. Um, and eventually from the other side it goes and reaches uh, one of the uh, BNC cables over here. Uh, FM is super simple. Uh, the input of the FM comes from uh, the front panel. And then you can see the output of the uh, amplifier. So it, it, the FM works the same. It's even simpler than, than, than the PM trans, uh, transmitter bit because it's just an oscillator, FM modulated, power amplified, then goes into a multiplier. So here you go. And here it goes out to the BNC. So yeah, the whole uh, noodle and rat's nest is totally explainable. And uh, there's only one wire that I'm not too sure of, uh, but I think I'm missing AGC. So uh, I suspect it's this one I could have missed. It could be either this one or the red wire. Uh, I'm not sure. Uh, and I haven't you know, measured what's in either of those wires, but we need an AGC connection. So this thing appears to be wired correctly. It does not look like a hoax to me. We could be silly and try to open up one of these modules, but we are not into teardowns here, quite, quite the contrary. We want to make this work again. So we now know enough that we feel confident we could debug it if we were to power it back up. And that's exactly what we are going to try to do in the upcoming episodes. See you then.